Hello and welcome to the LA Venture Podcast. We're David Waxman and Minnie Ingersoll, partners and investors at 10110. Hey, Alex. Uh, welcome to LA Venture Podcast. Great to be here. Uh, thank you. So we are here at Alex's beautiful office in Playa Vista. And Alex is a partner at Stage Ventures, where you do early stage... Stage Venture Partners. Oh, Stage Venture Partners. Okay, great. Uh, and you're doing early stage B2B investing here um, in LA and other places, I believe. That's correct. We invest mostly in the LA area, but we have investments as far away as Mexico and Israel and a few throughout the United States. Great. What percent of your portfolio is LA? About 50%, about 25% in the Bay Area, and then 25% everywhere else. It's similar to ours. Yeah. Except yeah, your yeah. office is a lot prettier than ours. Well, no, that's not true. We're in a lovely, we're in a wonderful co work <laughs> space that I really like, actually. But your office is lovely. Thank you for having us here. Glad to be here. Yeah. Um, so you have been an investor your whole career. So I am hoping there's a lot we can learn from you. I believe you started Anthem. Tell us a little bit about yourself and your career. Yeah, so I started uh, in venture nearly 20 years ago as an analyst at Anthem Venture Partners back when there were only nine VC firms in LA. Uh, there are a lot more than that today. Uh, there's more than that, of course, that have been on your podcast already. And so uh, the market has changed a lot and uh, there's been a lot of growth, which is really great for the community here. Uh, so I was at Anthem at a time when that firm invested in companies like Android and TrueCar and MySpace. I was just the analyst there in my early 20s at the time, so those deals are attributable to the partners, but I did work on them. And after that, I uh, decided to go into the public markets, which is also an area of interest of mine, and I launched a uh, long, short hedge fund where I was predominantly long, but I would uh, occasionally make uh, short investments as well. Ran that for a number of years. And then uh, I had some angel investments along the way that I was just making with my own capital and had a number of exits from that portfolio starting about seven or eight years ago. And it put me in a funny position where I was doing pretty well at my day job and I was doing much better at my hobby. Hmm. And hmm. I thought maybe the universe was trying to tell me something and that I should get back into my roots in venture capital. I think on your website it says enterprise B2B investing only. That's correct. And enterprise, just to clarify for me, remedial question, enterprise B2B, does that mean big sales only or will you do um, big sales as in it's, it's a SaaS model, I assume, but does enterprise mean something as a qualifier there? It does for us. And so, you know, we think there are three categories of enterprise software from a price perspective, and we like to play in two of them only. And so if you think about product-led growth companies that have a low price point and a freemium model, there are many successful companies, Slack and Zoom and the like. We don't really play there, and we find that it's hard to distinguish competitive advantage at the seed stage when there are so many companies building technology like that, when they appeal to office workers broadly, when they don't have a strong vertical focus, and when there are very few technical barriers to entry. Anyone can come up with a group chat product that has a cool feature. So where's the defensibility there? So we, we struggle with that. We just tend to stay away. That's not where we have expertise as a firm. We like to focus on vertical-oriented products at the application layer that have either an inside sales model at like ten dollars to $50,000 in annual contract value or that have uh, an outside sales model at $100,000 in ACV and up. Let's cover the basics. What size checks are you writing and yep. what sort of revenue or traction do they have? So we tend to uh, invest in companies that have raised $1 million or less in total capital before coming to us. They're typically looking to raise a round of $1 to $3 million. It's usually the first institutional round. Maybe they've received capital from angels. Maybe they've received capital from accelerators uh, in the past. Our typical check size in those $1 to $3 million rounds uh, is around 300 k to 600 k So that means that we're always syndicating. We have uh, lots of firms that we have invested with, including 10110, and we really make an effort to play nicely with others. Yeah, you're around a lot. That, I asked someone, I'm like, oh, yeah, do you know Alex? Oh, yeah, Alex is always out. He knows everyone. <laughs> I like that. Tell me about sort of how your pipeline flows and then how many you'll really, how many are active at any given time that you're really digging in with? And how many go from like a first meeting to a second meeting, if you know approximately? Yeah, so if we get about 1,500 that we enter into our deal CRM uh, per year, then 
we'll take a meeting with somewhere around 500 mm-hmm. doesn't you know which means you know more than one a day uh, in a in a typical week and I would say 10% of those get past the first meeting where we decide to move them up we decide to prioritize and do some further work and that work is all the same kinds of things that uh, many other VCs do we like to meet all co-founders not just the ones that are uh, leading the fundraising effort that's a big part of our diligence process. Uh, We like hearing from customers, uh, whether current or prospective, if we can introduce a company to a customer prospect in our network, that's often the best due diligence that we can do. And so the bottom of the funnel results in seven to 10 new investments per year. But I feel like digging in on three to five personally is about my limit or else I am dropping balls. Oh, at any given time, that's all I'm working on. You know, I mean, I can't dig into more than, you know, than you can count on one hand at any given time. So that 50 to 75 is what I'll work on over the course of a year to get to those seven to 10 investments. And are these typically referred companies that already have a lead? Because uh, I assume with, with the prices that you're talking about, or sorry, the check sizes that you're talking about, you're probably not leading most of the time. We lead or co-lead 30 to 45% of the time, actually. Oh. Uh, and in fact, the first check we, or the first company we ever led, we led a $2.5 million round with a $200,000 check. Interesting. Well, I stand corrected. We do that sometimes, too, actually. Yes. We lead rounds with not the biggest check. And so when you're thinking about the filling the round, like, and, and this is, you know, if you're going to lead a round, you, how much on the hook are you for helping make sure that that round is filled? It's a $2 million round, and you're putting in 300 400 k How much are the other co-investors all lined up, or how does that feel? So, so sometimes it's co-investors that the entrepreneur has found themselves and maybe they're a firm that doesn't like to lead maybe they're you know some other organization that doesn't have that capability and once we have a term sheet on a deal the rest falls into place very quickly sometimes it's that we get to something that very few other people have seen yet and then it's our job to help the founder go out and syndicate and uh, both of those can be very effective uh, processes, but one of them takes a lot more work from us than the other, but we don't care. Like, it's our job to put deals together. Love it. We see so many entrepreneurs that are, you know, they're raising a million and a half, they have a million already committed, but no one's willing to lead. We make our decisions independent of others. I am uh, days away from a term sheet with a uh, startup that had a potential to receive a lead from a high-profile venture firm in the that startups hometown it's outside of LA and I had thought it would be advantageous to have the local firm be a lead because people in that market know that firm better than they know stage venture partners from LA and uh, unfortunately that firm decided to pass on that particular startup that doesn't affect my decision to do the deal at all it just means I'm going to have to do a little bit more work to syndicate the deal what risks are you willing to take and not take when you're evaluating these deals so we tend to be very selective about the risks we take. We don't like to take competition risk. We don't like to have a sector where there are dozens of companies that we have met that are hard for us to make any kind of distinguishing decisions when it comes to product. And you're basically hoping that of the 20 people with a similar idea, you're backing the people who will go on to be the market leader. That that strikes me as... Vegas type odds and you know we're not in the business of playing roulette and so we like companies where there are very few people attacking a market we like new market risk we like product development risk and we in particularly like technology risk we like things that feel too complex and too hard for other people and the reason we like that is that once you succeed at de-risking that technology risk, once you get a product that's working and in the hands of customers, you often have a market almost entirely to yourselves for some period of time. So you're willing to take the tech risk or the product development risk. Mm-hmm. Is that, does that apply? How technical do you like, how much of a tech moat do you want there to be? As much as possible. Oh, great. Even if that means several that's years of, of development? <laughs> Yeah, we, I mean, we have a few companies that have taken 18 months or more to go from our investment to 
a 1.0 product. Um, I would say that you know that's on the outer end of what I would like to see, but we're certainly willing to do that. So, so let's pull this thread a little further. You're you have a company that's taking some amount of months or even over a year to to come to their 1.0 product, and then they have an enterprise sale in front of them. How do you make the money last? through the you know the period where you have enough proof to get other people Great on board. Great question. And one of the nice things about when you have a really big, chunky, valuable product, the customers often find you before you find them. There's, they're often so desperate for a solution that they will seek you out even if you are on a rowboat in the middle of the Atlantic at 3 a.m. in a hurricane. When you are looking for as much tech moat as possible, but you're willing to take that risk, what sorts of tech are exciting to you? So on the one hand, we invest in a few areas that we've gotten a lot of expertise in. But on the other hand, we are very deliberate about not being thesis driven. And so we, we don't make our investments by spending you know, a day at a whiteboard and then emerging with the proclamation that we're going to do insure tech this right. year. That's, that's not how it works for us. Uh, we tend to be driven by what great founders are doing. We try to listen more than we speak when it comes to deciding where to invest. And so in practice, we have had four core areas that have been uh, very active for us. We have had defense and aerospace related software companies. Uh, Southern California is, of course, the best place on the entire planet to uh, be doing defense and aerospace related work. Uh, for any of your listeners who want to see the history of that, you should watch a show on uh, KCET that aired over the summer called Blue Sky Metropolis about the history of aerospace in Southern California, which is amazing. I Ooh, love it. I can't it. wait to see it. Yeah, super cool. So we do defense and aerospace. We do hardware-enabled software, things like drone defense systems, holographic displays, robotic arms. We do um, various vertical applications of AI and ML. And then we do e-commerce software tools, basically selling the arms that everybody will need to compete in the war for survival that has been launched by Amazon. And e-commerce is such an interesting area because Amazon is so relentless that you do not have a choice. You have to be adopting the best tools or you will not survive. You mentioned verticals before. Mm -hmm. uh, can you tell us a little bit about some verticals you've invested in and, and what exactly that means? Yeah, so I, I guess to us it means... We, we like vertical-oriented software because it's easier for us to identify the ROI for the customer. It's easier for us to identify where we think pricing will be appropriate. It's easy for us to identify a go-to-market strategy when you've got a really tight group of customers who are able to use your product. Um, so most of what we invest in has that has characteristics like that. So for example, our e-commerce software companies, we have companies that do data integrations. We have a company that does data integration across all of the different applications that have a siloed view of a customer mm -hmm. in e-commerce. And so they're integrated with three of the top four e-commerce front ends right now, Shopify, Demandware, and Magento. It's easy to identify any e-commerce company just from scraping their code to see which of those platforms they're on. Um, it's pretty straightforward to acquire those customers to know the titles of the people within the company who are able to make decisions. And so you know what your angle of attack is when you have that degree of definition. When your degree of definition is Fortune 2000 companies, where do you begin? So everyone nowadays has, is building an AI company. True or false? Like I, everybody has ML or AI somewhere in there. How do you distinguish what's real, what's not real? Well, so, you know, it's fun to talk about what AI is and what AI isn't. You know, I see people saying that their product is built on AI and we dig into it and it's, you know, they're doing regressions, you know, or they have an algorithm and an algorithm does not an AI product make. And so we have spent a lot of time thinking about what AI is, what it isn't, and what kind of applications AI can be useful for. And we have a little mnemonic that we came up with that helps us to think about the core building blocks that are in commercialization today that you can build AI products out of it. We call it SOAR, S-O-A-R, Segmentation, Optimization, Anomaly Detection, and Recognition of Objects. If you look at what AI is doing, pretty much every AI product that we've invested in has been built on a building block 
that comes from those four core components. And as you know, one of the things that we like to think about very carefully is why now? You know, why is now the only time that you can be building the company that you're building? When we look at AI, we think about not only the arrival of AI technologies over the last seven years that make these tech, these products possible, we think about why have you been able to get some kind of proprietary data? We always like to say that, you know, a technology advantage in AI is fleeting. It will last only as long as no one else has published a paper freely available with a better algorithm than you. But if you have access to data that no one else has, you have something that can be quite sustainable. So we, we look for those kind of things. I think the data side is interesting. I was going with a little bit of thing about how sometimes the data can be licensed or aggregated because it's not really valuable to one person until it's aggregated. You're absolutely right that aggregating data across multiple customers, multiple data suppliers, and multiple multiple users is often what's required to get a corpus of data that is sufficient to actually build a product. And that's often re really hard and where the creativity of founders is most needed in order to build a product. And, you know, these conversations are not easy. You know, I always like to imagine a founder talking to a general counsel of one of their customers and handing them an MSA that says, you're going to hand all of our data to us and we're going to use it and we're also going to sell our product but not your data to your competitors. And I like to imagine the lawyer reading that and saying, you want me to do what? Right. <laughs> Happens all the time. For what? Yeah. And yet you have to convince the general counsels to say yes to that. You have to overcome the objections within your customer that the most conservative executive within your customer will have. And, you know, the, the job of a general counsel is to be the objection that you hopefully overrule. That is their job. That is how they see their job. Mm -hmm. And so some founders are good at that. And uh, we look for the folks who can be persuasive to that degree. But I think people are scared of AI or, or, or maybe there's populists. Not, not the investors aren't scared of AI, but like sort of the populist people are scared either that AI overlords are coming or that all of our jobs are going away or something. Will the robots take all of our jobs next week or next month? Right. Uh, <laughs> yep. You know, I, say, I would say that we have a kind of a different uh, view of that question because we see how hard it is to build and scale AI companies. We see how hard it is to get products out into the market. And I think people are I think people are looking at things wrong. Um, you know, as we sit and talk in October of 2019, we have a 3.5 percent unemployment rate, uh, the lowest it has ever been in modern record keeping. We've been below 4 percent unemployment for the longest period of time that that has ever been observed. We have record low unemployments among. Um, marginal and more discriminated against uh, groups in this country, including most ethnic minorities. And so things are like really good. And the idea that we are all worrying about the robots coming to take our jobs and that we have a venture capitalist running for president on a platform of universal basic income at this time, it's kind of mystifying to me. So I think that there is labor shortages. Like I, I have a friend who's trying to hire a bunch of reasonably low skilled jobs and it's hard right now. We have less immigration, I think. So I'm, I, I think I'm agreeing with you that there's sort of record lack of labor shortage. I don't know, too many negatives in there, but I think I'm agreeing with you that. But I think where it's coming from is that we have such problems in our society and that's where the fear is coming from is that things aren't working. So it's not specifically that the robots are going to take our jobs, but we have so much not working in our society and people need to point to something and AI is one thing to point to. And I think there are many things that are substantial problems. You know, we all live in Southern California, which has a tremendous crisis in housing affordability and a tremendous crisis in homelessness. None of those things are caused by AI. None of those things are caused by software or technology. Those are issues that are independent of tech. And when we talk about 
labor supplies. I'm glad that you mentioned that you have a friend who is recruiting for lesser skilled jobs and maybe lower paid jobs, because I think the people listening to your podcast are very familiar with how hard it is to hire a full stack engineer or to hire a really good account executive to sell software or a really good data scientist. Everybody knows that. That's not news. But what I think is news to a lot of people is that it is really hard to hire a line cook. Yeah, that's right exactly right. He runs a line of restaurants. And it's, it's the kitchen. It's very hard to stack right. kitchens nowadays. It is really hard to hire a security guard yep. in America right now. And I don't think we think enough about the kind of jobs that can be replaced by robots and the ones that can't. And so my acid test for a job that cannot be replaced by a robot is a hotel maid. Okay, you tell me how to teach a robot to determine that a hotel room is clean. You tell me how to teach a robot that how to teach a robot to fold sheets. You know, I can't make a hospital corner on sheets myself. I think the thing I've heard has been, well, doctors could get replaced, but nurses couldn't. And, and I think you could push back on either one of those statements. Yeah. So let's talk about doctors. So the the medical job that everybody talks about is radiology. And radiology is a really good example because computer vision applications can read film with the same kind of diagnostic precision as the best radiologist today. Now, what that means is that instead of paying somebody who has, you know, 15 to 18 years of education to read your film, you now will be able to do it with software And that doctor who makes half a million dollars is not going to be reading as much film. But more film is going to be shot. When something goes from having a marginal cost, and the marginal cost of reading a film is the doctor's time, to having no marginal cost, usage explodes. Usage often 10Xs or 100Xs. Think about how many photos are taken globally every year today because we don't have to worry about the cost of buying and developing film. I remember when film was so expensive. Now we take photos frivolously. So because the robots are on main, the radiologist job, we'll just use radiologists a lot more. We will consume vastly more radiological services than the world has ever consumed before. Um, There was a great... um, Do we need more radiology services? Do we need to be radiating people more? Uh, Do we need more imaging? Who, who said anything about people? We'll be, we'll be scanning x-rays of your dog. Yeah. I mean, do, you know, have you ever taken a goldfish in for a radiological ex, uh, exam? You will. Uh, there, was a, uh, there was a great technologist in... <laughs> he gave a funny look. Like, hmm, I will. <laughs> there was a great uh, technology pundit in the 1990s uh, named George Gilder. And uh, George Gilder was sort of, you know, a prophet of the early internet, and uh, he has, you know, since gotten a little uh, less fame because he recommended a bunch of stocks that cratered in the dot-com boom. But he's a really interesting thinker, and he basically says that technology changes the way that scarcity and abundance are allocated in society. If a resource was previously scarce, the incumbent good business practice would be to conserve that resource. When a resource goes from scarce to abundant, the proper business practice goes to wasting that new resource. And sometimes resources go from abundant to scarce. And when those relationships flip, when scarcity turns into abundance or when abundance turns into scarcity, the old business models break. And I think that's what we're seeing with AI. We're taking all sorts of things that used to have a marginal cost, and we're eliminating marginal costs. You know, I remember when AOL went from hourly pricing to flat rate pricing. And that month in 96 or 97, you had to dial 20 or 30 modem lines before you found one that was open. Right. And that was because everybody just stayed online all the time. More recently, we have all experienced the elimination of data caps on mobile plans. We've eliminated, we've, uh, we've uh, experienced the elimination of talk time caps. You know, I remember when you had 400 minutes a month on your cell phone plan and you had to make sure you didn't go over 400 minutes. No one worries about that anymore. Right. So I'm going to bring it all back to advice for entrepreneurs, <laughs> which I think it's interesting to just to get to know how you think because an entrepreneur should know who they're walking into the room with when they come to pitch you. 
Um, one of the biggest things that you said that I'm going to just highlight is the why now aspect, which I think is, is something a lot of VCs think about, but I think you say it more, you put more weight on it, it sounds like. It, it's, a, it's an almost disqualifying black or white question for me. And the reason I say that is I think that new business formation and new business success is a creature of time and a creature of changing circumstances. And something has to have changed in order to create an opening in a market to allow a new business to enter in scale. And that change in our business is often technology. It's often a, a new technology that enables something that had not been enabled before. Interestingly, it can be an external phenomenon. It can be Moore's Law generating processing capabilities that are no longer available. Or it could be the explosion of open source uh, tools in AI that people can now uh, assemble for a new solution. Sometimes it's external. I'm sorry, sometimes it is internal. Sometimes an internal change led by a single founder can create something where there was nothing before. We have a, uh, an investment in a holographic display company here in Los Angeles called Ventana. There was no hologram market before Ventana came into the market. There was no cost curve of declining prices in holograms. This was a static technology and a static industry that no one was paying attention to until Ashley Crowder decided to start a company and she lowered the cost of holographic displays by 90% instantly through her engineering advances. And so that was all internal. That was a technology change and a price change that was the creation of a single founder. Any other strong advice that's really useful for entrepreneurs, whether it's, I mean, primarily it's people who are early stage looking to get seed financing? I would say it's really important to know who your investors are and what they're looking for, which is why a podcast like yeah. this is so important. You know, everything on our website, everything in our public communications, everything says enterprise software, says deeply technical products. Um, the second most common type of business or category that we get after enterprise software is cannabis. <laughs> we don't invest in we don't invest in weed. I don't know anything about it. And I don't know what would encourage someone who's looking at my very public <laughs> profile and my very public history about what I do to say, you know what? What this guy, what this guy Alex really needs is some weed in his portfolio. <laughs> well, maybe. Maybe they know something you don't. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Who knows? <laughs> Um, uh, but, but like when I think enterprise software, uh, you actually sound quite different to me than say Bonfire. W when I hear you talk about what interests you, um, but I think I probably would have described them as enterprise B two B as well. And that's what's so interesting is that you know the guys at Bonfire are great, and we do overlap a little bit. Uh, we have an investment or two in common with them, just like we do with you. But I guess we just like the frontiers. Yeah. Um, there was a writer for the New Yorker. 70 or 80 years ago, who said something like, the wider the island of knowledge, the longer the shoreline of wonder. And we like to be investing, we like to be investing on that shoreline of wonder. We like to be on the frontiers of what is possible. You're going to get more cannabis after that shoreline of wonder. <laughs> Can we move on to, um, I, I'd love to talk a little bit about what you do after the investment. Um, enterprise sales is really hard, and is this something that you roll up your sleeves and dig into yourself? Is this something you get advisors to help companies with? How do, how do you engage with companies after you've invested? It's a little bit of both. So uh, one of the benefits of enterprise software is that you know, the go-to-market approaches are often similar. You know, Robert Smith at Vista likes to say that uh, all enterprise software companies taste like chicken. And th that's his quote. That is not mine. Let's be clear on From that. From a company that eats companies. <laughs> yes, and... And, you know, that company has its own MO, and uh, I'm not necessarily endorsing the Vista way, uh, but he does have a point, and, you know, he's become a very successful investor for a reason. But building awareness of a new company has common characteristics. You know, every company starts out in stealth mode, whether they want to be or not. Right. And we have to fight our way out of stealth. We have to fight our way out of obscurity and anonymity and ignorance. And that process is very common for enterprise software companies. 
um, how you price is very common, you know. I have founders ask me all the time, including one who asked me yesterday, you know, should I give a discount to my first customer or should I give the product for free? And I have a very strong opinion, which is that you price high and you discount hard for your early customers. You don't give anything for free. You print your value on every invoice and you stand behind your invoice and you give incentives for people to move first. Um, maybe other people have different opinions about that, but that's a very strong opinion of mine. Uh, so we like to get involved with that kind of stuff. And one of the nice things about the fact that I have no software development expertise myself is that I let other people worry about helping the founders with that, and I help with the stuff that I'm really good at. Love it. Uh, makes great sense. I think that's a great summary of who you are, and I feel like I learned a whole lot in, the, in today's session. Not all VCs taste like chicken. Not all VCs <laughs> taste like chicken, in fact, yes. Uh, great. <laughs> Alex, anything we missed? I think we're good. Uh, thank you for having me, and I look forward to uh, any of your listeners uh, coming and visiting stagevp.com. Fantastic. We'll thank send them there. Thanks, Alex. Thank you. Thank you so much. Super special thanks to Sandman12, Ale, Benjamin, and Mankiso, who left us reviews. Only one of you is a close friend of mine, so I really appreciate the reviews from, from all four of you, but especially the three that I don't know. 